Hey everyone, welcome to another deep dive. Uh, this time into something I think we all think about, but maybe don't talk about enough. How is it all going to end? And I don't mean you know this show, because I hope we've got a lot more deep dives ahead of us. I'm talking about the end times, specifically those different ways Christians, and especially Reformed theology, see the end of the world playing out. And luckily, we've got some pretty interesting source material to work with. This text conversation someone sent us really gets into the weeds on amillennialism, postmillennialism, even the good old pre-tribulation rapture. Which, honestly, all those are pretty different ways to see the same puzzle pieces fitting together. Yeah, it's like everyone's got the same scriptures in front of them, but completely different pictures of what the final product is supposed to look like. So to get us going, let's unpack amillennialism. Right off the bat, just that word amillennialism. It can be kind of a mouthful. I was going to say, it's a bit intimidating. It is, and honestly, a little misleading. The A at the start doesn't mean there's no millennium. It's more about how amillennialists understand Christ reigning for a thousand years. So not denying a millennium exists, more like what it represents. Exactly. For these folks, it isn't some future literal 1,000 year period where Jesus is physically ruling on earth. They see it symbolically. That time between when Jesus ascended and when he comes back, we're in it right now. The church age is the millennium for them. Whoa. Okay. So we're already in the thick of it. But then what about all that stuff in Revelation about Satan being bound up for a thousand years? How does that work if they interpret the millennium this way? Now, that is where things get really interesting, because amillennialists do believe Satan's bound, just not completely powerless, not totally gone. It's more like Christ's victory limits what evil can do, but it doesn't make temptation or sin disappear. Like, imagine a fly that just keeps buzzing around your head. Ugh, the worst. I hate that. Right. Super distracting, maybe even makes you stumble around, but it can't actually control you. That's how they see Satan during this symbolic millennium. Still causing trouble, we see the effects of that every day, but not the one truly in charge. That's still Christ, even if it doesn't feel like it sometimes. Okay, that actually makes the lead up to the final judgment way more intense when you think about it that way. Satan's still scheming around, even if he's on a tight loose, adds a whole other layer to the idea of living in the already but not yet of God's kingdom, you know. Exactly. And that's a key point for amillennialism, this tension. Christ is reigning from heaven, but we also clearly see things are far from perfect down here. So we're working towards that final judgment, that ultimate righting of wrongs, but we're doing it while acknowledging Christ's rule is already real, just not fully revealed yet. So it's this incredibly significant time period for us, even with all the struggles mixed in. It's not just some waiting room for when things get good. It matters what we do right now. 100%. And what's wild is how well this lines up with broader reform theology, which, if you're not familiar, really stresses interpreting the Bible in context, especially the symbolic metaphorical stuff like revelation. It's not about nailing down a date on the calendar. Mm -hmm. It's seeking the deeper truths. Looking past the literal to what the message really is. Right. And if you apply that to the millennium, suddenly amillennialism makes a lot of sense. It's yeah. not about arguing over when it starts and stops. It's about Christ's rule being a present reality, mm -hmm. impacting us, working to the church, all that. So already, amillennialism gives us this view of the end that's super deep, but also incredibly relevant to how we live now. But obviously, it's not the only game in town. There's got to be a different way to see things. Right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And next time, we'll get into one that's a lot more optimistic. Oh. We're going to unpack postmillennialism and why it sees things a little bit brighter when it comes to the end of the world. Sure. So picking up where we left off, and millennialism gave us this symbolic millennium we're living in right now. But postmillennialism, that's a different flavor entirely. Way more, shall we say, hopeful about how humanity makes it to the finish line. It's like if amillennialism is an abstract painting, this is like someone took that same idea and made it a huge, vibrant tapestry. So break it down for us. What's at the heart of postmillennialism? What makes it the optimistic one? Well, you've got some views out there that say everything goes downhill before Christ comes back, right? Postmillennialism says not so fast. They believe things actually get better, like way better. Right. That the gospel's influence gradually spreads until it's transforming society, leading to this golden age. Oh, wait, hold up. Instead of total collapse, it's like things get insanely good before the end. That's a bold strategy. Let's see if it pays off for them. It definitely is. And that golden age, that's their millennium. Not always a strict 1,000 years. More about a period where Christian values and principles are just the norm, leading to peace, righteousness, prosperity, the whole shebang. Imagine turning on the news and it's all swords being turned into plowshares and nations finally figured out how to get along. 
That's the vibe they're going for. Talk about a serious glow up. And that reminds me of that verse in Isaiah, right? They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation won't lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. It sounds like post-millennialism is aiming for that whole prophecy to be fulfilled big time. Nailed it. And they're not just sitting around hoping it happens either. Post-millennialists see the church as a huge part of making that golden age a reality. Evangelism, social action, just living out Christ's love in every corner of life, that's how they usher it in. The idea is, as more hearts change, the society itself follows suit. So it's about actively participating in redemption, not checking out and waiting for rescue. Okay, but if the world's already this haven of peace and all that. Where does Jesus coming back even fit in? Seems like he'd show up and be like, party's already started. Hope you brought snacks. You're not wrong to wonder that. The order of events is definitely different here. Christ's second coming isn't the start of the good times. It's the grand finale. Like the fireworks show after a whole day of celebrating. Huh. That is wild. Makes you think, why isn't this view more popular then? Especially in reform circles, didn't they used to be pretty into post-millennialism back in the day? Oh, you did your homework. Yeah. There was a time, especially when things seemed to be looking up for society, that post-millennialism really resonated. God's in control. Christ's kingdom wins. The gospel changes hearts and systems. It all fit together nicely. But you're right. It's lost some steam since then. And honestly, it's not hard to see why. Yeah, uh, the 20th and 21st centuries haven't exactly been putting out golden age vibes, have they? World wars, dictators, the constant news cycle. Hard to square that with things steadily getting better, even if you're really trying to be optimistic. It's true. All that suffering and injustice makes it tough to argue we're on the fast track to utopia. Feels like every step forward, we take two back. That being said, even if it's not the most popular view nowadays... Post-millennialism makes you think, right? Like, what's our role supposed to be in shaping the world around us? Even if a golden age feels far off, Christians are called to do something, not just wait around. 100%. Whether or not you buy the whole golden age idea, the core message is valid. The gospel has a social impact, not just a personal one. So even amidst the mess, we're called to be those agents of reconciliation, fighting for justice, being peacemakers, all that good stuff. So we've gone from a symbolic millennium that's already here to post-millennialism's like super hopeful vision of how things play out. But we can't talk end times without addressing the one that's taken over pop culture, the pre-tribulation rapture. That's a whole other deep dive right there. Oh yeah, that's the one that gets the movies made, the books written. It's a captivating idea, gotta give it that. Believers suddenly gone, escaping all the bad stuff. Definitely gets your attention. But how that lines up with reform theology, well, that's a whole nother can of worms. Mm -hmm. And we'll crack that one open right after the break. All right, we are back. We've covered some ground, huh? Symbolic millennia, golden ages. But now it's time for the one that's always got everyone talking, the pre-tribulation rapture. That's the one with the movie trailer music playing in the background. Oh, for sure. It's got that edge of your seat feel to it. I mean, who wouldn't want to be whisked away before things hit the fan, right? <laughs> Can't say I haven't thought about it. But before we get into the whole Reformed theology take on this, remind us how the pre-tribulation rapture is supposed to work. What's the timeline look like? All right, so picture this. The world's looking pretty dicey, end times are approaching, then bam, Jesus returns. But not the big everyone sees him kind of return, not yet. This one's more of a secret. A blink and you'll miss it moment where, poof, all the believers are suddenly gone. Up to be with Christ. Just like that. So like a VIP exit for Christians before the real trouble starts? You got it. And oh. for those left behind, well, that's when the tribulation hits. And it's not pretty. Think natural disasters, wars, famine, the works. Oh, and did I mention the Antichrist? Yeah, he shows up too. Charismatic is all get out, but definitely bad news. Okay, so not a fun time for anyone left on Earth. Things go from bad to worse pretty quickly there, but then what? Does Jesus come back again after all that? He does, eventually. After those seven years of tribulation, Jesus makes his real entrance. This time, it's the big, glorious, can't-miss-it second coming. He defeats the Antichrist and all that, sets up his kingdom, rules for a thousand years of peace. That's the millennium in this view, after all the chaos. Okay, so to recap, secret rapture, tribulation, then Jesus comes back and rules for a thousand years. Got it. Pretty dramatic stuff. But how does this, especially that whole disappearing act at the beginning, line up with how reform theology usually sees things? They tend to be a little less mm -hmm. 
literal. <laughs> That's the million dollar question. And honestly, it caused some arguments even within reform circles. See, as widespread as the pre-tribulation rapture is, especially yeah. among evangelicals, it's not like reform folks all jumped on board with it. Really? Why is that? What don't they like about it? Well, a huge deal in reform theology is interpreting the Bible in context. Like, what did those words mean to the people who first heard them? What kind of literature is it? You got to take all that into account. So not just picking and choosing verses that sound good for your argument, but actually understanding what they meant originally. Exactly. And when you do that with the verses people use for the rapture, like First Thessalonians 4.1617, it gets fuzzy. Yeah. That part about being caught up to meet him in the air could just be talking about Jesus's one visible return, not two separate events. Context is everything. So it's not as clear cut as some folks make it seem. Not at all. And that leads to another big difference. Reformed theology is all about Jesus's return happening once for everyone to see. No secret sneak peeks. So one big undeniable he's back moment, not a two-parter. You got it. And that ties into how they see the church's role in all this, which is pretty different from just getting beamed up before things get messy. That's what I was wondering about. If we're not getting whisked away, what are we supposed to be doing while we wait for the end, according to the Reformed view? Here's the thing. Reformed theology doesn't see the church as some delicate flower that needs protecting from the world's problems. It's more like, we're God's plan A for fixing those problems, even while we wait for Jesus to come back and finish the job. So less about escaping the mess, more like we're in the mess, but on purpose. Exactly. It goes back to that amillennial idea. God's kingdom is already here, just not in his fullness yet. So we're called to live that out now, working for justice, showing love, being peacemakers, all the things that point to a better world, even if it doesn't feel like it sometimes. It's like we're a preview of what's to come, showing the world what God's all about, even amidst the brokenness. Way more active than just waiting to be rescued, that's for sure. You got it. The pre-tribulation rapture might be comforting, but the reformed view, that's a call to action. It's wrestling with tough questions, being engaged, and trusting that God's got this, even when it's hard to see the finish line. So while the rapture is a fun idea to think about, reformed folks are a bit more cautious, huh? It's about sticking to what the Bible really says, not just the parts that sound good. Right. It doesn't mean everyone agrees on every detail, of course, but there's this commitment to digging deeper, thinking critically. That's what makes these discussions so fascinating. It's like, we can disagree on the specifics of how it's all going to go down, but at the end of the day, our hope's in the same place. Jesus wins, he makes things right, and we're called to live like it's true. Couldn't have said it better myself. No matter what view resonates with you, that's the core message. It's about living out our faith in a way that makes a difference now, knowing that a better world is coming. What a great way to wrap things up. We've covered a lot today. Three different views on the end times, all with their own quirks and nuances. It's enough to make your head spin, right? Seriously. Yeah. But you know what I think is the most important takeaway from all this? It's not so much about obsessing over when or how the world ends, but about letting that hope of a new beginning shape how we live right now. Absolutely. That's a question worth asking ourselves. Yeah. How does knowing that Christ comes back, that he wins, how does that change how we treat each other, how we spend our time, all of it. Hopefully that's something our listeners keep thinking about long after this is over. Well said. It's been great unpacking all this with you. And to everyone listening, thanks for joining us for another deep dive. Keep those questions coming, and we'll keep exploring them together.